Welcome uh, everybody to the virtual global lecture hall. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we are now ready to start the last lecture of this year uh, series. The, it will be as usual, we will have a, a number of cool uh, uh, lectures by, on, actually on various topics, uh, on uh, the, the visual neuro neuroscience of manipulation and grasping, on what we think about, what we are saying when we, what we talk about, when we talk about think machine, right? and uh, also uh, an, a very nice uh, presentation on the legal issues related to the, with the deployment uh, of robotics, because you know that we had dogs, uh, we were people guilty of any kind of crimes, but uh, we had no robot <coughs> messing around. So we, we need some kind of regulation. So of course there is a, uh, Andrea will explain it in, in much more detail, but uh, we, we have some basic principles that we can already use, but they need to be adapted. So it will be, um, as usually, uh, widely interdisciplinary uh, lecture, but should hopefully see the, your in, imagination and inspire you in your studies and your research. So I, I would start, uh, now we were talking about this third wave, the wave is uh, uh, fed by um, morphological computation, self-organization, emergence, uh, this new kind of, of uh, cognition science that should uh, allowed to build the robot that you see in the science fiction movies sometime, some, one day, some day. So I think we may start immediately with a movie, with a, uh, the TED 2023 20, movie, from, which is a, actually a viral video used to advertise uh, Prometheus. Maybe better that the movie in itself. Personal opinion. T. E. Lawrence. T. E. Lawrence. Eponymously of Arabia. Lawrence, very much Arabia very much Favored pinching very a very match between his fingers to put it out. When asked by his when colleague, William Hart, to reveal his trick, how is it he so effectively extinguished the flame without hurting himself whatsoever? Lawrence just smiled and said the trick, Potter, is not minding it. The fire that danced at the end of that match was a gift from the Titan Prometheus. A gift that he stole from the gods. And Prometheus was cornered and brought to justice for his theft. The gods, well, you might say they overreacted a little. The poor man was tied to a rock as an eagle ripped through his belly and ate his liver over and over. Day after day, ad infinitum, all because he gave us fire, our first true piece of technology, fire. 100,000 BC, stone tools, 4,000 BC, the wheel, 9th century AD, gunpowder, bit of a game changer that one, 19th century, Eureka, the light bulb, 20th century. The automobile, television, nuclear weapons, spacecraft, internet. 21st century, biotech, nanotech, fusion and fission and M theory. And that was just the first decade. We are now three months into the year of our Lord, 2023. At this moment in our civilization, we can create cybernetic individuals who in just a few short years will be completely indistinguishable from us. Which leads to an obvious conclusion. We are the gods now. For those of you who know me, you will be aware by now that my ambition is unlimited. 
You know that I will settle for nothing short of greatness, or I will die trying. For those of you who do not yet know me, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Peter Wayland, and if you'll indulge me, I'd like to change the world. Uh, Fabio, the mic is off. Why I like this movie? First of all, it is set in 2023, and uh, what uh, the, main, the speaker says in this fictitious uh, TED talk uh, makes some sense. So, by 2023, we may be able to build some uh, nice humanoid useful for helping the elders, maybe really not a conscious system, maybe not a particular a system sophisticated as iRobot movies, as in the movies, but something really useful, able to, to do some significant core and manage with a, with a medium level of uncertainty in, in, in your house or, or in a street or in a bank or in a factory. So it sounds realistic. The other thing that I like is, is that uh, I, I, I told already last time that the pe people working at these colossal movies in Hollywood usually do some uh, serious research uh, on uh, trying to, it's science fiction, but they try to, to be as realistic as possible. No? So, for instance, uh, when uh, um, Blade Runner was uh, Produced uh, in the early 80s, uh, it, it seemed realistic to have replicants, more or less, four years from now. We are already there with the pollution in many areas of the world. Still, we don't have anything uh, uh, close to a replicant. Uh, so, uh, this 2023, since it's a much more recent prediction, now seems more realistic with some. But, but what's also interesting, the idea of the exponential development of technology. Uh, so if you uh, listen uh, to, 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 the, to the character, to the speaker, uh, uh, he, what's not true is fusion technology, which is not yet here. Uh, well, last year, for the first time, uh, they obtained uh, more energy from a fusion reaction uh, then uh, they pu pushed uh, into the machines uh, using laser uh, uh, inertia confinement. And despite the fact that a week ago in, in Germany they were for the first time able to um, contain plasma. So we are also doing some progress in, in, uh, in, in, that, in that direction. But uh, all the rest is true. So it's true that we are clearly accelerating the technological development. And the other, uh, the other thing is that uh, um, so when M theory really exists, is one of the flavor of the string theory. Um, it might even be one of, of the more, most uh, credible. We, we, we miss all the, the next 10 years, right? So how far are we from building real robots? Because this, uh, so this lecture is meant as a kind of. Uh, of, of summary, no? so, well, where we are, because uh, last time and other uh, times they talked about the first, the second, the third wave. No? Uh, here we are actually talking about the third, third wave, so the general ideas that we are pushing are ideas which are now uh, essentially a program of research, as we have seen from many, many guest lectures. The other thing that I like of, of this movie is that uh, uh, usually, entrepreneurs uh, are uh, um, because I am a bad guy. No? Usually, entrepreneur or big, uh, let's say, unique, you know, unicorn are super big uh, uh, startups uh, which have uh, more than one billion dollars of capitalization. No? So usually, the entrepreneur is uh, depicted uh, as a philanthropist, as people wanting to wishing to help uh, humankind. What I like in this 
small movie, which I thought I think is better than the big movie, but this is not the personal opinion, is that the interpreter is actually dressing and is the body language of a gangster. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's something that uh, I appreciate. I, I'm not here saying that a um, uh, high tech interpreters uh, are. They are not gangsters, but I think that it is uh, uh, quite provoking to, to, to give this idea. No? So actually, it's usually people also driven by the, the will to have uh, money and power apart from helping humankind. No? So it, you, you need to, to, to see things in, on the different standpoints. And, um, so how far we are there? This is, will be essentially the topic uh, of, of today's lecture. How far we are from uh, real robots? Hmm. So we are for real robots. I mean a, a robot which is dependable, uh, is able to, to perform significant tasks like uh, perform an elder's uh, hygiene course or um, helping uh, or substituting where apply, it may apply people into the factory, in, for instance, in the assembling of a control panel or into a, a sewing of, of, a, of, of clothes. And what could be the implication of such a thing? Because it's not, um, so for sure, technology expands possibilities. <laughs> Always and capabi be our capabilities. Mm, I mean, we have example like uh, so. So far, nuclear fusion has been used for the worst. Uh, fission fusion is also used for good and for, for bad. So technology is something which needed to to be managed at several levels. So the society need, needs to think uh, about what. Uh, so, so just to as a summary. Huh? So the, the idea is that this top-down uh, uh, mechanistic approach of having the brain separated from the body, uh, a state machine driving uh, um, a mechanical system is old. This is not the older example. It's, I mean, it's vintage. It's two centuries ago. There are examples like this in, in the ancient uh, Greece and in the even older in the ancient uh, China, and there are examples more or less at the same time in, in Japan. So this, this Karakuri, an illustrated anthology, Karakuri Zui, is actually uh, one of the very first handbook of robotics that has been written, so, so to say. Uh, and then, uh, where are we are, well, um, so is this a bad approach? Well, not really, because we, you can do uh, fantastic things. And here we, we may see the movie uh, that on Melfi. So this, uh, uh, this misset, the uh, top-down mechanistic uh, uh, approach actually can uh, provide a very interesting solutions. Uh, look here. Yeah. So this is from uh, actually, uh, since uh, I a bit, uh, sometimes I indulge into some nationalism. This is from an Italian company in, in uh, Italian-American uh, uh, automotive uh, company. But, uh, uh, you, you may find similar things. So this is very advanced, but you, you can find similar example from Kukau, from Fanuc, uh, and from many other, other processes. So it's not... Uh, the point is that you can do a lot of things. And another point that you notice in your area is, uh, can you see any people there? No, you can't see any people. Why? Because those robots uh, eat so to be hit by those or one robot is very much like uh, having a car accident. So it's extremely dangerous by itself. And so one uh, of the uh, issues that we have in front of us now is that actually people is already solving, we are solving other people are working on that, is how to interact uh, with robots. And basically you have two, two, um, two ways. One is to reduce the inertia, so to have small, uh, light robots. The other is uh, uh, improving control. So I mean, you 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 can have a, a jacket which 
signal to that system that you are approaching and the system will reduce speeds uh, 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 accordingly. So uh, you may have different approaches. This in the context of what I dismiss as the good old fashioned approach. So you can do many things. So we're not saying that it's not a good approach. It's a very good one. So what, uh, um, and then we have a second way. Now this is essentially, um, many of you may know, some don't know, but people who don't know it. It's control theory and it's linear control. It's something that is well known. It's not particularly difficult to do. Many times it's tuned by trial and errors. And after a lot of efforts, a lot of programming, a lot of trial and error, remember then it's example of a bomb disposal robot. <coughs> but you can do it. You control the environment because it's a, it's a factory. Your system is... Um, um, put, uh, doesn't manage well shadows, okay, you will put uh, big lights and there won't be any shadow. So you, you can manage these kind of things. Of course, what's the, the side effect? You have to put there a lot of effort, a lot of maintenance to keep the lights uh, lighted and, and, and everything as it, it is expected by the design of your robot. And every time that you have some unexpected problem, you will add uh, 2,000 of line of codes, you will stop the factory and you will... So this is something which works. I mean, in the past, the people was able to, 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 to sur survive uh, with much less technology that we have, but it's not uh, maybe ideal. So the next, uh, uh, next stage, which is probably where we are now, so it's uh, the, um, our application like, for example, the Google car. And you may show the video of the Google Car. This is the first step, folks, uh, and it's really exciting to see the progress we've made. The opportunity for people to just move around and, uh, and not worry about it, it's going to be incredible. I love this! No, you know, that uh, a problem that many times uh, old people, but also children go, is going to school, have uh, is that they cannot drive their they own car. Uh, so we, we depend uh, a lot uh, on, on cars. And, and so um, having autonomous uh, driving car is, is something that uh, uh, it's it is useful. And uh, where is the difference in between uh, this uh, um, this autonomous <coughs> car and the robot that we saw before? Uh, before, the, uh, we, in the factory there were no people, and they were, weren't there because uh, still in that factory, but most factory, even the most advanced, like that one, you don't usually have people. You have people doing research on having we have seen something last time, you know? so on uh, soft robots they, that don't arm people. You, know, they, they, you may remember the then student Sami Adadi, now professor, uh, it by, by the robot, something that you should n never do in, in, in Murphy Factory. Uh, um, but there are no people because they are no managers. In this case, people are not only close to the robot because that egg-shaped car is a robot, but they are even inside the, 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 the car and move it by the robot. And, and their life at, at, at more or less at this position depends on the algorithms running on the car. So this is kind of new situation where uh, I think Andrea will, will tell us something. But is uh, this what we is this application coming from what we are discussing here? Well, in, in this case, no. Very example. No. I did the example of the fact that uh, from the, uh, from Meta and Fitzpatrick uh, paper, where actually they show using a very, uh, um, I would say, ordinary humanoid robot. That uh, okay, if I move this, no, if I move this, I can see what's on it. No, this is a, a very, very low level of approach, a uh, way to exploit the fact that uh, interaction with the world helps the perception of the world. No? So this is, seems absolutely stupid, right? But it's not so stupid. There's not many 
systems uh, did this uh, until very recently, and, uh, and it's something that you can exploit to what purpose? Because uh, the objection to the net example is that okay, okay, I will catalog, I will build a catalog of all possible problems that my robot in my half structure environment may find, and then we'll add a function to manage every possible strange occurrence. Well, yes, but you, you have an exponential growth of a possible occurrence. And this will mean an exponential growth of your code, because finally you have a microprocessor and some code running over micro, of a microprocessor. So the, what's new in, with respect between the so-called second wave, which is the current wave, which is actually feeding a tremendous um, uh, economical impact already, is uh, uh, machine learning, some perception capability, some good old-fashioned AI applied to the robot. And you see the results. So you, you have a car that can don't need a driver. This is a, a, a significant progress. And then we come to, to uh, again, this is uh, again a uh, repetition from, uh, I think, uh, one of the very first lecture. And, and we, we may say the famous robot, uh, or, uh, the famous movie of the Asimo for, uh, of Asimo, uh, should not be, uh, you, you, there should not be a spoiler risk sir, because I think you have seen it already. Um, okay. This is a very famous video and actually is from uh, some almost at this point, I think it's almost uh, 10 years ago, I think 2008, something like that. But it's very, very, very uh, expressive uh, of uh, because today, okay, let's wait a bit to see the main fact. You see, this is, uh, you have seen it uh, already, I think. And uh, uh, there are uh, another funny, uh, similar things. Actually, this was several years ago, and now I, I don't know. Recently, I, I don't remember any public uh, fall of Asimo. Why? Because they used the Dennett approach, so they added, added some routine to manage several situations that can occur, like uh, putting the foot not exactly on the, on the step of the stair. No? Because the, this tremendous catastrophic fall is extremely unnatural because it doesn't go down as we do, or I don't say the cats, but as we fall, we more or less we try to balance and to move in such a way that we reduce the, the damage of the impact. It just goes down. Bah. Huh? <laughs> so this is, is really explicative of the, of the limits of the, the, the let's say, standard, ordinary mainstream approaches. So, so far mainstream, because I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, so how you solve this? Adding code. And every time that you find a new strange situation that can occur to your robot, you add some new code. As many times we have said, this put clearly a limit. We don't know exactly where is the limit, but it's clear that there is a limit. So now we can see the counter example, so the inner life of a cell. Okay, this, uh, uh, this movie, which was produced uh, by Harvard University to visualize uh, the state of the art uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the understanding of cell mechanisms, internal inner mechanisms, 
It, it's interesting, even if it is a very short uh, movie, gives you immediately the idea of, of, of a different uh, um, organization. So this is not organized, uh, so it's not the mind, meaning a set of algorithms running on my computer, which exchange some signal with a, with a body and have some camera to, to reconstruct the environment. And so this top-down control. This is almost the opposite. You have many, many, many uh, small parts interacting stochastically in a kind of uh, loose network of, of networks. And uh, all the behavior is a merger. So what, uh, because this, uh, for instance, when you see the, the small, so this uh, even funny thing, you know, because of course our common sense uh, it, it has been built to, uh, uh, to interact at a different scale than the cellular scale. Uh, uh, no, you, 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 that's, uh, this small thing uh, no, moving on this rope and carrying this enormous molecules, not molecules, uh, um, structure be, be, be behind. This actually seems to be linked, uh, is linked to the mechanism of, uh, not call it happiness, but to the mechanism of, uh, mechanism of uh, 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 pleasure. No? So, um, so it, it's uh, uh, people are working in neuroscience knows uh, this, this kind of, of, uh, of reaction. But uh, what we are interested in is to know that this is many, many, many pieces loosely connected with an emergent uh, behavior. At, at the top, uh, uh, there are many layers of this kind, and at top of that, there is uh, the emerging process of, 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 of our consciousness. But this seems completely, uh, it, it's completely different. So we can maybe stop here. So, since I, I, I'm talking about summaries, the, um, so, and here, here is uh, where the classical AI approach uh, shows uh, its limits. So we, uh, the, the capability to manage uh, unexpected events like uh, uh, I put uh, uh, my, uh, my feet uh, on, on the wrong place of the stair. And I told you, of course, you can have some routine to do that. But when you will find a different, uh, as nature, uh, as nature stair, and then you will find something else, maybe an hole in the street, or maybe there will be wind, or maybe there will be uh, not the kind of light that you wish. Uh, um, no, so we essentially cognition. So the cognition, uh, it's the cognition is computation paradigm is against the cognition emergent for sensory motor interaction. And then uh, we have uh, the um, frame uh, we, um, as to, uh, if you want to be fair, there are two uh, complementary issues uh, in uh, with the approach, uh, the symbolic approach uh, and the uh, even integrated by a lot of learning and statistical um, management of, of uncertainty. And, uh, uh, and call it a, um, an approach inspired by morphological computation and uh, emergence, which is the frame of reference issue. So, in fact, if you think, if you remember the example of a Simon's ant of a beach, uh, you have this idea of ant doing some very complex uh, uh, path on the beach, but uh, this is actually due to the fact that. Uh, and the end, you remember all Cruz uh, studies, it reacts a very, um, let's say, it's a very short time to avoid obstacles and to, to, to the um, characteristics uh, of, of the terrain. Um, the, um, exam, the, the FOIT experiment you can do is, okay, let's multiply the end by 10,000 times, and what's going on? It, what's going on with it is that the behavior event will be completely different on that beach. On the other end, we have a symbol grounding issue. No? So because uh, if I pose myself 
I put myself uh, in the condition of saying that the symbolic representation is emergent, and this might be already a, a, a bit improper because uh, what actually uh, people like uh, Rodney Brooks uh, used to say already in, in the seminar paper that we intelligence without representation that we, we quoted uh, a few lectures ago uh, is that uh, we really do we really need uh, a representation and then uh, there was a, a bit more recently uh, um, <laughs> another paper by Luke Steele's Intelligence with Representation from the with our same point of view where uh, Luke Steele's argues that uh, essentially you need some kind of structure to give a, a short, a short kind of description of the world. So we may don't even, we may, or in many cases for sure, probably ants don't have any kind of symbolic representation of the world, and they work, the same for spiders. So what you really need is a, a, a physical agent which is adapted to perform a, a number of, uh, call them tasks, of, like, to show a number of behaviors interacting with a given environment. This is what we know. In this case, uh, in many cases, uh, a, a symbolic representation is not needed at all. And even when, if you put yourself, and I actually uh, agree on, uh, on such an approach, uh, an approach like uh, Luke Steele's, uh, so, okay, I need some kind of short end. No? So if I have a phone, so I need a... Uh, uh, so even in that case, the point is that this sign, symbol of a phone should emerge from sensory motor interaction. So uh, given my sensory... Um, my, my physical structure, my way of interaction with the world, and uh, uh, my um, perception system, I, I may have uh, this idea of this phone. Another system may not need this, uh, uh, the idea of a, of a phone. Uh, so the, uh, actually, if uh, at all, as told before, there are many systems which are much better than most robots, which don't prob almost for sure don't have any kind of symbolic representation. We have, but we are a very late stage of, of evolution, and uh, it's probably a big mistake to think that this symbolic uh, representation is not uh, evolving by our body interaction and by uh, our history no? because uh, okay so and now we, we we go back on the Turing test issue and uh, we we may recap with a number of uh, videos the first of, of, of them is the one from ex machina which is a recent um a recent movie on the topic When a human interacts with a computer, and if the human doesn't know they're interacting with a computer, the test is passed. And what does it pass to us? That the computer has artificial intelligence. Are you building an AI? I've already built one. And over the next few days, you're going to be the human component in the Turing test. Oh, my shit. Yeah, that's right, kid. You got it. Because if that test is passed, you are dead center of the greatest scientific event in the history of man. If you've created a conscious machine, it's not the history of man. That's the history of God. Okay, uh, just... Uh... Okay, it's not necessary to show the other one or from, from the same movie. We may... So you, you may know... Uh, but I, if you don't know, I tell you that uh, the Turing test here is performed. Uh, uh, essentially, the real test, uh, actually, the main character, 
the interpreter and our work, this romantic uh, interpreter working in, in Norway to this secretly on this AI is actually fooling the Nathan, the Nathan of the movie, uh, another famous Nathan, uh, making believe that uh, he has been selected because uh, he is a, a very good programmer, so AI programmer, so he is able, he should be able in principle to understand uh, if a machine is a, uh, is a machine or is not. Actually, the second purpose of the, of, of the first guy is to see if a machine is so smart that it is able to think autonomously to seduce the young guy to, 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 to convince him to free uh, her. Now, because the, the, the limitation of the movie is that the, this is a very typical role attributed to women. <laughs> but uh, okay, that said, this is a kind. Of, uh, remember this because uh, um, we will come back on this. So and now we have uh, the, uh, another movie taken from Blade Runner this time. So today I, I, I want to be a uh, movie. Uh, so I want to show uh, to show you many movies. You're reading a magazine, you come across a full page nude photo of a girl. Oh, we have seen already. Testing whether I'm a Republican or a lesbian, Mr. Deckard. Just answer the questions, please. You show it to your husband. He likes it so much, he hangs it on your bedroom wall. I wouldn't let him. Why not? I should. You remember that. To show with a similar interrogation from the same movie, of course. Uh, You're watching a stage play. Uh, one of the very first actors. Uh, in that case, it finished the very finished badly. Uh. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, it's, it's a, a, a little. Talk. It's smooth, uh, right? Just to spoil another movie. So the main character here doesn't know. But she is a, a, a replicant. Would you step out of the box, Rachel? Sure. So this is another example. So in this case, the test is performed by a guy who uh, a essentially runs like in the example of Leon, uh, uh, the other replicant at the beginning of the same movie and the beginning of, of our lecture cross was, was performed and uh, took more than a hundred for Rachel. It means an uh, uh, issue uh, of asking a number of questions which are supposed to promote the different Others. reactions uh, so in, in, in humans uh, and, and replicants. Those where replicants are being hypothetical kind of, 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 of machines uh, uh, able to be self-conscious and to be, uh, for all other things, uh, not distinguishable from, uh, from humans. So the, yeah, the idea is that if you ask the right questions, at some point you will discriminate if that person is that person, it's a person, is, a, let's say, carbon-based uh, or silicon based, uh, assuming that uh, uh, robots will be silicon. Yes. And then yet another iteration of a QD test, uh, and it is uh, the AIVO versus DOG. It's already this or a similar one uh, has been already shown. Right? So you see, we have this AIVO DOG, a uh, robot which was popular yeah, years ago, and the DOG. Looking at the same point, you know. Okay, may we <laughs> may we say that the dog? So the dog actually uh, behaved with uh, uh, Aibo like it was a dog. So this is a kind of Turing test. So the uh, so yeah is uh, I would like to 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 listen some some opinion from, from, the, um, from the audience, because uh, is any of these three example what uh, Turing meant as a Turing test? 
Of course, I, so that's any one. Uh, I don't know if some of you remember uh, what uh, the Turing test is, was supposed to be. Hi, Josh. And, uh, So that, that's any anyone who want to, to try. So, mm, for instance, the difference. So, uh, in principle, we are doing the same thing with a dog. We want to see if the dog uh, um, thinks that the Aibo is a dog, essentially. No? So, if what how the dog reacts. The other is uh, how, in, in the other case, uh, I do a, a long list of questions. And in the other case, uh, I try to see my system, which is clearly, uh, because there is another difference. So it thinks to dog dog. Now, an evil seems a dog, but it's clearly not a dog. Hmm? Um, the replicant uh, in the second movie uh, it seems uh, a normal woman, young woman. No? It's an absolutely normal. So you, you, you may be fooled by the appearance. Uh, but you, you, we have seen, uh, and you have, you can see a lot of androids which are very similar to, in, have a very similar appearance to people. Maybe they are not uh, wet, they are not um, warm, but I mean, all of those problems could be solved at some point. Uh, the, um, and in the first one, the one from Ex Machina, the robot is clearly a robot. So the face is the face of a woman. The hands are the hands of a woman, but it's clearly a robot. So the interrogators know that uh, the uh, system is a robot. And the question is not, is this a robot or a human? Is, is this system conscious and intelligent? So it's a different question, which, by the way, is the same question of Turing. So you, you see the difference. May someone try to tell me the difference? Don't be scared eh, because they are not uh, stupid uh, comments. Any? Ah. <laughs> Any? Ah, I, mean, I don't like to provide the, the answers. Okay, I see that nobody dares to. So it, it's quite. Uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, one of the main difference is that uh, in the Turing test uh, the interrogator interact uh, without seeing the system. So it doesn't know. She doesn't know if it's interacting with uh, a system or not. In the Turing test, you have two. Uh, tested system, the human uh, and the machine, and you, you, the, the task is not so. It's a bit more sophisticated than the popular pop culture uh, movie representation of the of the Turing test. No, because uh, uh, the the idea there is that that you are not able to distinguish. Uh, two system, uh, so you put in comparison the two system and you are not able to distinguish. You know that there is this Lobna price uh, that uh, is they have promised it to the first uh, um, person or group able to, to pass the Turing test. And uh, you may know that uh, there was a lot of, of uh, media excitation uh, one year ago on the fact that uh, um, a system was supposed to have passed the test. The system was uh, uh, behaving like uh, a 12-year-old uh, um, student and was able to to fool free. It was a standard uh, Turing test, so it was real people and system, uh, and uh, was able to 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 fool free people of a commission of five, and so. Uh, in particular, in the UK, there was this uh, media uh, wave uh, saying, ah, the, the system passed the, the, the Turing test. But uh, what actually the free, full person attributed to, 
to, to the AI was that it was uh, at 12 years old. Uh, but I would say, since I am a bad guy, that uh, uh, the um, members of the commission were middle-aged, and maybe they have very bad expe uh, low expectation from 12 years old. And so, but, so is that true? So this is another open issue. So. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I don't think uh, that uh, has, has really been passed. But uh, you, you see where are uh, the limit of this. Uh, so we also had another popular uh, movie, which was the imitation game of this, actually, under many respect, very successful, but under other respects, very sad uh, life of Alan Turing itself. You know, that, you know, they have a problem because uh, in the 50s uh, in, in the UK uh, being uh, homosexual was considered uh, a, a tremendous crime so you had a kind of chemical castration procedure medical procedure so it was a, it's a very very bad story you know? and uh, recently he was pardoned by the Queen of England but uh, apart from from that, uh, so uh, you see where are we living. So how many people need to be f fooled by the system uh, to say that the system uh, uh, has passed the test? Three or five is, is enough. And what uh, what uh, are actually they testing? That they have simulated uh, the in mm, chatting interaction of a 12 years old. But with respect to what? So it, there are limits. Now we also have seen uh, the Chinese room experiment, and uh, just uh, to um, to um, to conclude this, uh, what you should uh, uh, remember is that the uh, Turing test of X machina is not a Turing test. And the replicant interrogation of Blade Runner, it's not there. My, uh, for instance, I think that the idea of telling you that this is a machine is, is not a bad idea. But uh, it's not uh, the Turing test. The Turing test is much more, uh, under a certain respect, uh, sophisticated and smart because it's a comparison. Uh, and we, I attribute to the people here the fact, the consciousness. Uh, uh, and the intelligence by analogy. I, I don't even know if Georgia is a replicant. I, I, I have no real <laughs> ways to, particularly without opening air. <laughs> no, so uh, I really don't know. So in what we can do in the perspective uh, of, uh, and I will finish uh, uh, soon, uh, mm, of this uh, uh, emergent in paradigm, I, I need new models. I need to model how this kind of emergence of behavior can be structured. A promising approach was introduced, for instance, by Ungarella Spons, uh, working on the idea of information substructure. So, um, actually, what drives behavior is the, incre the learning of the proper behavior is the capability to predict the effects of my actions. But it has to be in a very, um, in an approach that doesn't commit to any symbolic representation. Then there are, you may leverage on some probabilistic model of control. And, and you can uh, uh, build several models, of, starting from there, you can actually show how morphological computation works and maybe build uh, models of uh, uh, morphological computation. An interest uh, uh, example in that direction is the snake bot, which is a kind uh, of uh, a very simple system made of balls loosely connected, which by maximizing predictive information, which is a technical ways to represent uh, how well you manage the information coming from your sensors to predict the um, behavior of your creators. It's nice because it behaves like a real crotalus without implementing any behavior into it. So this might be one of the ways. It might be less easier and it seems so you may have to work in non-Euclidean spaces because the space of the moving of the body is not Euclidean. And 
So it, it's uh, an open, so it's work for you, for those of you who are going to work in research, this is a completely open uh, area which is actually related, uh, sometimes is uh, called uh, bio-inspiration, sometimes called bionics, um, sometimes as we do it's called embodied AI or embodied cognition. Uh, and this is something which is on the border between engineering and science, because on the one hand, uh, we have seen the, there are clear limitations in the current paradigm of design of robots, and we, are, we want something more robust, essentially something more robust. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we want to understand how natural intelligence works. And since uh, natural intelligence is the effect of a very long and random and uh, lawyer and cumbersome and messy process, uh, and sometimes it's possible with uh, looking into real animals uh, um, and trying to reverse engineer them, uh, it, it's not so easy. It can be helped by building small models, more technical robot, uh, models, uh, which try to see if the principles are correct. Because of the principle, I mean, you know that we have the appendix. Now, the appendix into our uh, um, digestive uh, apparatus uh, is a completely useless. And there are probably a lot of, uh, of these things. For instance, you know, the, well, you may have heard of dark matter, but there is also the junk DNA. So there is a lot of DNA, DNA which don't know for what it's calling, right? Probably it's calling for something that we, for some function that we don't even imagine, but there might also be a lot of DNA which is still there because it was there and now it's not anymore used. This makes also a lot of sense. So synthetic methodology is a way to say, okay, let's try to clean the signal. I think that the behavior is based on morphological computation and emergence of self-driven information uh, growth. Okay, let's build the system and see what happens. So, and this, of course, has to be done end in end with people working on the natural system. So, uh, robots, uh, apart from being from, uh, and this is another story that I will leave for another time. No, robots, apart from uh, uh, being a tool, a practical tool, no? kind of machines for doing things that other machines cannot do. For instance, carrying your grandpa. Uh, to your uh, grand uh, uncle uh, house. Uh, this is uh, something interesting. The other thing is that it, they are a science tool. They can be used to understand how uh, natural intelligence works. Uh, I think that uh, I can finish here for today. And then we will have time to discuss this in the round table later today. Mm. So, thank you. I don't know if you have any question of com or comments, but maybe we can leave them to, to the round table, huh? which is actually about all this, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So now we may have uh, five minutes back at, uh, and, uh, at 10 o'clock uh, TET. So maybe since we are running of the, uh, out of time, we may go directly into the round, uh, round table discussion with uh, people still present and uh, so uh, I may start uh, we, so we, we may condense uh, the, uh, the free so we may start from uh, Angel that I know it, it will be pushed out of the room very quickly and uh, so uh, your take on these three things your major the major achievement so far the major open issue, and the major, uh, what we should do, what you should focus the research in three minutes. So big achievement, uh, big problem unsolved, and what we should research. Uh, Simple well, questions. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, I, in fact, there's uh, some kind of uh, scheduling problem. I. I need to leave this room in, in five minutes, so I can just say a few things. I would like to stress um, 
what I previously mentioned about the manual intelligence. I think uh, in general the robotic community is uh, deserving not enough attention to actually making room robots uh, behave with this uh, exhibit. Uh, two minutes, okay. Exhibit uh, actual manual intelligence compared not just to humans or even monkeys or even if you have a squirrel or they are able to manipulate or open, uh, break a little uh, seeds or whatever. So uh, if, uh, if you compare uh, present robots to you know, systems uh, to the ones we had some years ago, there's some improvement. But still, uh, if I look back at uh, when I started with all this some 20 years ago, I don't see so much progress. So uh, that's my what I would like to say. So I would try to emphasize this need for actual, because otherwise we, we are speaking about this uh, robot companion or whatever. Uh, if the robot companion is not able to behave uh, manually, this kind of manual intelligence. So it's not about uh, taking complex decision or whatever. It's about doing very simple things, opening uh, doors and uh, select an object. And um, we, if, uh, as a professional, I, I usually look at myself uh, every day or look at people what uh, we all do every day with our hands. This is an incredible amount of uh, abilities that are very, very, very far from any any system that is completely uh, brittle and uh, no autonomy or uh, lack of robustness. So I think we should, that's my message uh, today, and uh, I have to leave, sorry, I cannot stay here for the rest of the of this round table. We need to uh, progress in uh, by uh, both uh, progressing in, in the actual uh, neuroscience, uh, Together with, uh, I think uh, there are very good results in engineering and very good results in, in uh, what, uh, what the question was about before, uh, in, in, in the actual uh, implementation of the arm, of the, in, in, with all the tendency of sub-robotics, of the control, etc. All together, and need to we need a fundamental leap forward in this in this domain, in which refers to actual using of uh, robot fingers to do actual and coordinate both hands uh, with, with the with the visual system, with the tactile system, and actually perform not very complex but uh, basic abilities that are lacking today. And, and that's I think that's uh, my message. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the short uh, contribution to the front end, uh, compressor contribution. So now we, we can uh, move uh, to maybe to Rolf. Rolf, have you something to say on this? So major, about, uh, biggest achievement, uh, yeah. biggest problem, what we should research on. <laughs> Well, Rob I think is the father uh, of the Shanghai well, can, Yeah. Well, can you can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. So I think uh, uh, really so one, one uh, I think major development that has taken place in robotics is that previously 20 years ago uh, the robots were confined to the factory halls and since then they have started leaving the factory halls. And robots recently, in recent years, have come very prominently into people's awareness in general, not only scientists and experts, but uh, I think the um, people, the, the community, the worldwide community at large, everyone is now talking about robots. And I think that's a great achievement. You know, 20 years ago, this was not the case. We had to wait for Google to buy these eight companies so that robots would come into general public awareness. And I think that's extremely important because I think with all the issues that are coming up, and we, ha we heard a great talk today about legal issues, ethical issues, I think there we need a debate, a very broad debate among the population at large, not only among experts, about these issues, if we really want to have progress, if we really want these robots, service robots that share their living space with our with our own. So I think there's, there's maybe a different level of um, issues that I would like to raise. Having said that, I fully agree with uh, Angel on uh, his assessment at the technical level. 
Okay. So, uh, and uh, what, uh, in terms of research, what do you think uh, we should uh, focus on? Research? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I think I, I agree. The biggest issue in research, in your okay. opinion. Okay, I think one of, okay, a really big issue in, in my view, I think we have a good understanding of, of uh, learning systems. We now are beginning to have some understanding of social interaction. We are mm -hmm. beginning to have an understanding of sensory motor systems. But what we have not investigated, really, neither in psychology, in developmental neuroscience, nor in robotics, is the interaction between sensory motor development and social interaction, for example, language. And I think there is an enormously direct connection between these, and that's what we should investigate as one of the big issues in understanding and building intelligent systems. Okay. Oh. Oh. Что такое нажала и все исчезло. Ой, 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 ой. Вы сказали, что можно просто нажать. Okay, I think we was that. So we may uh, now uh, ask Josh his take on this. Josh, what do you think about the, so biggest achievement, uh, biggest issue, and, and maybe sure. what we should research on. So I think in terms of achievements, uh, many robotics labs have produced very uh, impressive robots, as I mentioned, that do one thing and do one thing uh, well. Um, in, in my own work in evolutionary robotics, we've demonstrated a simple robot that can recover from physical damage. And it does a good job, but it does not play chess or walk down a ramp or walk with, in an energy efficient manner. So I think. Our achievements have been to replicate specific aspects of biological organisms, but not general capabilities of, of organisms. So um, in terms of open issues, I think one of the open issues is the issue of scalability. So Mother Nature did not have 12 robotics labs around the world and produced a few dozen robots. She produced trillions and trillions of uh, organisms over millions of years. So how are we going to scale up our study of robotics? As Rolf just mentioned, um, robots are now center stage in uh, the public uh, awareness. Can we, can we exploit that? So in terms of untapped opportunities, I think if we are going to try and address scalability, design and study and build robots at a much larger scale, um, we need to exploit the cyber uh, infrastructure that exists out there. So cloud computing, I showed you an example of crowdsourcing. There are hundreds and thousands of uh, 3D printers that are now available in schools and, uh, and other places. Can we, can we invite the, the global uh, community, as Rolf mentioned, into the enterprise of building robots and studying adaptive behavior? So I think the untapped opportunity is all of the cloud resources, the crowd resources, and the 3D printing manufacturing that's, that's out there. Let's, let's build a worldwide community to, to study robots on a much larger scale. So thanks. Actually, we are shortening a lot the, the round table to the very free big issue. So we will have a final round with the people still present at the end. So maybe Verena, I, I noticed that uh, uh, some of the people uh, here are either or students, so kind of son or daughter of Rob from academic science uh, or fans and supporter or even adop adoptive sons of daughter. So Verena is another direct academic daughter of Rolf. So, very well, So, hi. Um, so, about achievements so far, I would say that in particular the embodied artificial intelligence approach has, has given inspiration that we should um, not look into, for example, sensory motor coordination and cognition as separate issues. And I think that's, that has quite started well, that we can also look into um, 
to to find solutions for real world problems and we've seen that in the last years that we um, that robots start to really cope in in, in natural environments as well um, looking at what what um, Google produces the autonom autonomous cars and there are other robots. Then, um, um, but of course there are lots of open issues and I think one major, major issue we should approach is that the diff different disciplines are not working together as much as they, they, they could be doing. So for example, there's, there has been lots of progress in machine learning. Um, um, lots of progress in, uh, in psychology, philosophy, and so on, artificial intelligence. But each of them are, are kind of um, looking at their, their own things. And I think we can only reach new, new results if, if there's more cooperation and more interdisciplinary work. And um, that we should also focus on really understanding the principles of intelligent beings or, or machines and not just trying to optimize certain behaviors without understanding the principles. Um, well, untapped opportunities, I'd say um, we could look a bit more into all the ethical issues, into all the practical issues that arises with all these new um, opportunities. Um, legal issues as we saw today, for example, autonomous cars, um, they are possible today and they, they pose um, huge, huge um, ethical and, and legal questions. And also what has been mentioned already that for um, especially human robot interaction, um, there's still a lot to be done when, when, when robots should, should interact in natural environments together with, with humans. I think that's, that's all. We may, uh, we may ask uh, maybe to Martin, who is a kind of a nephew of Rolf, so uh, the son, academic son of uh, uh, an adoptive uh, son, <laughs> maybe. So Martin? Yeah. OK. Um, well, I uh, agree with what's been said so far. I think we've been, we've been very good at kind of keeping up with the increasing computational power that we've been uh, um, having over the last decade. So more slow still in operation. So we're good at that. We may be not so good at, <clears throat> in my opinion, at uh, appreciating the, the, the increasing complexity of a task as you go from a, from a plane, so a, an autonomous car or a Roomba, and move to something much more like a, a human body with tens or hundreds degrees of of freedom, so the degree of freedom problem I think we're still struggling with. Um, and then I think there's an opportunity, going back to the Robolo um, presentation, when we were talking about risk assessment um, and the difficulty in insuring robots. Maybe we have a, a big research opportunity there for soft robots that are uh, kind of uh, inherently safe, uh, passively compliant, and maybe uh, because of that also easier to assess the risks of such robots operating in the real world. That's, that's all. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, now we may ask another opinion by a lawyer. Okay, so um, what is what, what the major achievement could be a methodology, uh, a methodological one? I think that the methodology that was developed by Robolaw is quite innovative. The approach that we adopted a functional uh, bottom-up um, approach, not top-down, but it's quite novel to jurists and resort, highly resorting to um, empirical analysis and uh, with a law and economics methodology. That, I think, is what is needed today. A major challenge in the medium run is to adopt an adequate regulation, an adequate framework for to allow uh, real-life testing of many robots. So I, I do believe that it's essential for the development of a, a, a good robotic products and of an industry for robotics to develop an adequate, uh, an adequate legal, legal framework for that. Um, and what shall we be researching upon? Well, I think the major issue, as I said, is that of liability and identifying what works and what does not work 
in existing and applicable liability rules. And how to do that? Well, we need to study mostly private liability rules in a, an empirical law and economics fashion. And that is precisely what we're trying to do. OK, thank you. Uh, I see the, uh, Antonio from uh, the consciousness guy. What do you think? So uh, same question from uh, for I. Uh, same question for that we for the other. So bigger biggest achievement, uh, open issue, and what we should research on. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I agree with Rolf. In my opinion, the biggest achievement is that today robotics is considered a common argument in the cultural debate, and in particular um, the link. Uh, between robotics and psychology, philosophy. So um, today we can debate about embodiment, about emotion, about consciousness, as you uh, as you mentioned. Um, uh, several years ago, this was not possible. So today, I think that this is uh, the biggest achievement is that in uh, several disciplines we can discuss about uh, the robotics methodology. So to try to try. Uh, for example, psychological uh, experiments by using robots or uh, any kind, kind of experiments which are outside robotics, um, they use robots for their, uh, their, uh, um, for their, for this, uh, in my opinion, the biggest achievement. Um, an open issue that I say today is that uh, um, we need to, in some sense, reconsider um, after after all this discussion about embodiment. Uh, I think that we need to reconsider the role, for example, of representation, the role of symbols, the role of logics, the role of, uh, of semantic networks, or whatever. So the role of all the uh, AI system. In my opinion, today, uh, after. Uh, the lesson of embodiment, um, we need to reconsider again the role of representation. Um, about the untapped of the two, um, I think that uh, we have to study more into details uh, um, how do we measure uh, trust, how do we measure uh, how people trust in robotics. Um, how to measure the trust and the change of trust in robotics uh, for a user, for people. So, which is the correct level of trust? Uh, some people trust too much in robotics, they may be, uh, and other people trust too people. Um, how do we measure? So, do we have a reliable measure in robots from, from, from the user? And this is, in my opinion, one of the, the biggest uh, program that we have to, uh, that we have to so, okay, idea. thanks. So, thanks for, for your comments. Uh, um, I think, is there anybody from, uh, for instance, for Northwestern or from Shanghai wishing to comment uh, on, on this? If not, uh, I, I would say. <laughs> So Russia, Russia's State News for the Humanities. Can I add, can I comment? Ah, yes, of course. Yes. 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 Uh, my name is Vera Zapotkin and I am just the head of Center for Cognitive Studies. I'd like to thank Rolf for raising the question of social interaction and language and robots. I think it's one of the challenges facing cognitive science in general and robotics as well. And I think what is still lacking is sense disobligation of polysemous words. And if we resolve this problem, then there will be more interaction and there will be fewer mistakes that Google Translation is making. There will be fewer misunderstandings and uh, that's what is needed. And I think that it's only possible by way of integration at three levels methodological integration or methodological knowledge integration, theoretical knowledge integration and empirical knowledge integration, all these three types of knowledge. And also we could raise a question of discourse and knowledge because discourse is language. We get information, we get new knowledge from two sources, actual contact with the real world and from discourse. And the robotics should be approached from this position as well. 
Anyway, it's just a very brief addition, but I think it's important, and we are going to, to work with our artificial intelligence experts at our university and cognitive linguists in this direction. Thank you. Uh, Fabio, your, your mic is off. Uh, sorry. So I don't know if you, we may leave the final word to Rolf if you want to say something. Ah, just goodbye. So uh, I want to um, to thank you or uh, everybody for attending and contributing to the lectures. In particular, uh, I, I want to um, to thank uh, the teaching. Uh, uh, the tutors, because you know that uh, the, um, actually the lecture will finish with the Cohen's presentation end of January, and uh, Tapio, Ricardo, Jimmy, and Jose Carlos are doing a lot, uh, great work tutoring a different group of stu students who took the challenges. So uh, again, thank you everybody. Thank you, uh, the people uh, Antonio, Josh, uh, Angel who left. Rolf for starting the whole process years ago, Nata for his uh, great uh, co coordination of, of the video lecture, and so see you next year, and thank you again, and happy holidays. Bye-bye.